You know, I was surfing the headlines today and uh, this morning before I came in, and it's kind of fascinating. You look around, there's flooding going on all around us. One of my friends sent me a picture of his house in North Carolina, and the water's about four feet up the side of his house. You see people uh, from Hurricane Sandy out on the East Coast are now five months without electricity. I have one girl that's a quadriplegic in a house that hasn't had electricity that entire time, and they can't get her out but her neighbors are coming in and taking care of her. And you see all that kind of stuff going on. Uh, Yesterday in Pakistan, over 100 Christian homes were burned down by Muslim rioters. And you ask yourself, I mean, you have to ask yourself, what in the world is going on? How did things get so messed up? Well, let's dive in and let's look at it, okay? So here we go. Follow, Follow along with me and your listening guide there. Number one, how did the world get so messed up? Well, I'll tell you, the reason's really really quite simple, and it's this. We've all sinned, right? We've all sinned. And when we sin, it brings evil into the world, and evil's contagious. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, right? Evil's pretty contagious. So let's look at this thing and listen in your notes. Or what is sin? Sin, in general, is any attitude or any action against God. So sin is anytime you do something God has said not to do, or you do something that's against the spirit of what God has said we should do, you know, uh, it brings sin into the world and it creates evil, and the evil affects more than just you and me. Now, where did that all get started? Well, it starts all the way back with the very first couple, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Watch this from Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Simple explanation. Sin came into the world because of what one man, that's Adam, did, and with sin came death. So there was no death prior to Adam and Eve sinning in the garden, but death came in with Adam and Eve, and we've all been culprits too, Ecclesiastes 7. There is not a single person in all the earth who is always good and never sins. Now, okay, so we've kind of said sin is anything that goes against God, but Actually, the Bible uses three different words to describe sin. And it's interesting because they're all three different kind of categories or or facets of sin that we don't think about. Let me explain those to you. There's three kinds of wrongdoing. Number one, the word sin, it's there, okay? And it simply means to fall short, to fall short. Now, so you know this, sin is actually an archery term. You know, it was fun going yesterday to watch the, 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 our class graduate. They got their certificates for participating in the, the, the heart shop ministry yesterday. It was fun going in, seeing my daughter whip all the boys. I love that. Um, I'm not going to have to worry about that girl on a date. And that makes me feel good. So, um, but it's actually, it is, it's an archery term. I remember the first time, I'll give you a, a good picture of it. The first time that I deer hunted in Iowa, I deer hunted with Todd, who's here today. Hi, Todd, wave your hand. Okay, so I'm deer hunting with Todd. We're out, out west of uh, Bluegrass Aways, and I'm borrowing one of his bows, which is way too big for me. Because I have like these short little arms, and he's like a gorilla, all right? So he's got these big, long arms. They're not exactly a knuckle dragger. Sometimes. Um... But uh, so I'm using his bow and I have this deer comes down and he walks and he stops and he's probably not 20 yards from me. I mean, it was an easy shot. So I pull back and I shoot and guess what my arrow does? It hits the ground in front of the deer. In front of the deer. All right. So guess what the deer does? No, he just stands there. So I shot what? Todd, do you remember? Because you, you were across the creek. I shot four more times. And every one of those arrows landed in front of the deer. And then to add insult to my ego injury, the deer leans down and licks my arrows. <laughs> now, <laughs> what did I do? Well, in archery terms, I sinned. I'm not going to tell you how, but I did sin beyond the archery terms. Um, it means to fall short of the target. That's why scripture says all have sinned and what? Fallen short of the glory of God. So that's the idea behind sin. So God has set a standard for us and we can't reach it. We fall short of it. So that's the idea behind sin. All right. Now, here's the second descriptive term, descriptive term and it's transgression. 
transgression. Transgression means to go beyond. It's like God has, well, where sin means you fall short of the target. Transgression is like God has put up a fence and said, don't go past this point. And what do you do? You blow through the fence. You climb over the fence and you go. Or here's another one. By the way, the speed limit on 80 from the river to the 280 interchange is 65. Now, people from Illinois don't know that. I'm just informing my Illinois people. Because I think every car that we've ever pulled over when I've been riding with my troopers has been from Illinois <laughs> coming into the, the free land. Um, <laughs> escaping the asylum and coming over to where normal people live. Okay, so when the speed limit is 65 and you decide that you are going to drive 80, guess what that is? That's a transgression because you've gone beyond what it is. So I've decided I'm going to willingly, I'm going to go past what the law has said. So God sets a boundary for me and says, don't go past this. Don't go into this area. Don't do this. And I choose to do that anyhow. That's transgression. All right, now here's the third one. The third one is iniquity. Iniquity, if that's the evil within me, wouldn't that be a great movie title? That's what I was just thinking. I thought, man, that, I should write a movie. Yeah, okay. The evil within me. <laughs> iniquity is about what's inside my heart. I mean, iniquity, it's an attitude of my heart. It's about my basic disposition to just decide I'm going to do my own thing anyhow. I know what the rules are. I know what the goal is. I know where the boundaries are, but I really don't care because I want what I want what I want. And so I just decide I'm going to wander away from God. Now, there's a reason why... God refers to us as sheep so many times. You know what that reason is? Sheep are stupid. <laughs> they are. Sheep are sheep. Sheep are just like they're like amoebas with fur. I mean, they are they were wool. They are stupid, you know? And sheep get in trouble. They, we used to do things to sheep at my grandfather's farm. My grandfather was actually a shepherd. And, and I think my brother Tim and I, when we were little, we'd actually go out and get sheep and you know, we, he didn't have cows. Not really, at least no cows we were going near. And uh, so we didn't have cows to tip. So we picked on the sheep. And what you could do with the sheep is you could cover his head and drag him into another room and take the bag off his head. And he did not know where he was. He might have been in that room a thousand times in the barn, but he was lost. Or you could get him and you could actually lay a sheep down and hold him down long enough. He would forget he was down and think he was still standing up and he would be fine and he would just stay there. So sheep are not smart. When God calls you his sheep, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's not like a refrigerator magnet type love saying, okay? He's telling you just how stupid you are apart from him. Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned his own way. In other words, everybody's doing his own thing. So God says, I want you to do this and go down this path, but we say, eh, I like this one over here. I'm going to go down this path. So we have this tendency to wander away from God and do what we want to do. That is iniquity. It's my natural disposition. It's my rebelliousness against what God has said. Now, check this out. I love this next verse we're going to look at because you see all three of those kinds of offenses in one verse. Watch this, Psalm 32. I acknowledged my sin, which is what? falling short of the goal. I didn't live up to the expectation. I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my, the rebellions of my heart, the rebellious nature of my heart. I said, I will confess my intentional violations of the boundaries. And I love this. And you, God, forgave my guilt. And that's beautiful. But that gives you a word picture so you understand. It's too, too much of the time we just try to make sin a small thing. Sin's pretty broad, all right? So in my rebellious nature, let's go to the next thing. B, why do I choose to go against God? Why do I choose to go against God? One, it's in my fallen nature. I mean, I've got a sinful nature that I inherited from Adam, the very first man who ever sinned, and that means I am predisposed to go my own way, right? Have you ever tried to take a toddler to a public place and let them walk beside you? What do they do? 
They go their own way, right? It's, it's part of our natural disposition to just take off and do that. Romans chapter 8. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. Listen, when you're in Walmart and you see that woman dragging that screaming kid down the aisle by his leg, Romans 8, 7. Okay. <laughs> Jeremiah 17. The heart, is the, the heart is deceitful above all things. In other words, you and I have this incredible ability to tell a lie. We make up in our head, we make up a lie in our head, we tell it to ourselves, and then we believe it in our heart. <laughs> so we believe our own press releases, you know? We, we believe our own lies and we tell ourselves, eh, it's not that big of a deal when it really is a big deal. And listen, that's really dangerous. But it's just part of my nature, okay? Part of my fallen nature. Number two, it's also in my nurture. It's also in my nurture. The truth is, you also learned how to sin from the people who were around you. And your family wasn't perfect. And you picked up some of the imperfections that they modeled for you. And some of you have perfected them. You are the kings and queens of dysfunction. One of the things that amazes me whenever we go back to see Steph's dad, he lives in the town where I grew up. I like to read the, the local newspaper. <laughs> and I, t I kid you not, if you take that local newspaper and you open it up, because they still do a police blotter, like so-and-so on Elm Street called because of a stray dog, you know? And one I loved was a squirrel that would not leave the porch, you know? <laughs> and the police had to go handle it. And I don't know if they tased him or what. Um, <laughs> But that kind of stuff. But when you start reading who's been arrested and what they've been arrested for, I kid you not, it's like the same thing that was there when I lived there in high school, except now it just has JR behind the name. <laughs> it's the same families. You know, there was a study done across jails in the U.S., and they found that in just about any given jail in the United States, that between 60 and 70% of the people in the jail were related to each other or from the same neighborhood? Yeah. So you pick it up from the people that surround you too. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15. Just in case you didn't know this, do not be deceived. Bad company does what? Corrupts good morals. All right? It's in our culture, number three. It's in our culture. Paul says in Romans 12, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all that you do and think. In other words, don't let your culture tell you what right and wrong is. Don't let your culture tell you that it's going to squeeze you into the mold and then you just sit there. He says, it said, let God transform your life. See, the world's a mess because we've all sinned. There's a lot of pressure on us to sin. That sin has caused some problems for us. Here's the result of it. Number two, we live in a broken world. Now, the Bible calls this the fall of man, or just the fall. But the truth is, we live in a broken planet. In other words, everything on this planet has been broken, damaged, injured, spoiled, corrupted in some way because of our sin. Now, let's look, let, me, let me give you five evidences of this, all right, well, that the world is broken. First one, A, there are natural disasters and deformities, you know what? Nature doesn't always act the way it's supposed to, right? How many times has the weatherman been right in the last two months? <laughs> not, not many. You know, not many. Yeah, I would not want to be that guy. You see one of the news stations, the manager came out and made the weatherman sit in a corner. <laughs> Punished him for getting, a, getting the weather wrong so many times. <laughs> I can't believe he's still employed. But, uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> They've messed up the weather forecast. How does that happen? Listen, nature doesn't act logically sometimes. I mean, why are there hurricanes? Why are there droughts? Why are there earthquakes? I looked in the backyard today and I got four inches of water all the way across my backyard. I checked my mom and dad's weather and they have fire alerts out because it's so dry where they are. Well, the answer to that's simple. The plan has been broken by our sin. Romans chapter 8, verse 20. For creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will. In other words, the original plan, the original purpose of creation was to be in harmony with God and in harmony with us. So we would be in harmony with God and nature. Nature would be in harmony with God and us. God would be in harmony with us and nature. But then sin fractured that. 
And our sin shows up in everything from fire hazards in Texas to flooding on the Mississippi River to deformities in a newborn child to diseases we have to deal with. It's a result of sin. All right? Next thing, B. There is physical decay and death. Physical decay and death. 2 Corinthians 4. Our physical body is becoming older and weaker. Simple glance in the mirror in the morning. We'll tell you that one, right? We're on a broken speak for myself. <laughs> we don't even want to go down there. Okay. Yeah, we live on a, bro a broken planet, right? All right, next thing, C. There's emotional stress and disappointment. Why? Because we live on a broken planet where evil and sin exist. It, Stress is a result of living in a damaged, sinful world. Check this out from the book of Job. I love this. Job chapter 6, verse 20. Remember, Job had a lot of bad stuff happen to him. That's why it's not really good news. When someone tells you you have the patience of Job, that really means your life sucks, okay? Yeah, people don't want to be you. Job chapter 6, verse 20. They are distressed because, well, they had been confident. But they arrive there only to be disappointed. You ever have your heart so set on some event you're going to go to and you get there and it's not as advertised? Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Only he's saying that's how life is. People live and they've got these big dreams. And when the time comes, it's not what they thought. See, Scripture says the only thing you can trust is God's truth, right? <laughs> Everything else is going to let you down. Everything else, you've you got a high probability of failure in. That's why it's so important, those of you who have kids, you have got to teach your kids how to handle failure because they're going to have more failure in their lives than they're going to have success. Believe me, they'll handle success pretty well. It'll freak them out at first, but they'll handle it. Failure, though, is going to be a problem if we don't teach them that they're going to live through it. Or as a friend of mine says, we've got to teach them to fail forward, to learn from the fail and move on, right? Nobody succeeds at everything, all right? Next thing, D. Since we live in a broken world, there's relational distance and discord. I love this verse about Adam and Eve before they had sinned, Genesis 2. Now, although Adam and his wife were both naked, neither of them felt any shame. Listen, Adam and Eve, they knew this innocent, secure intimacy, not just physically, but emotionally and relationally too. I mean, they didn't have baggage from other relationships, right? They didn't have baggage from other things that had happened to them. There was no embarrassments. There was complete openness, complete trust. Sin changed everything. Genesis 3, 7. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they strung fig leaves together around their hips to cover themselves. Here's the point. When they sinned, it didn't just disconnect them from God. It disconnected them from each other. And you and I have been dealing with that from the very beginning. We've dealt with it ever since. I mean, you think about it. Every single conflict you have is based on sin or insecurity caused by sin. Every single marriage conflict you have is based on sin or the insecurity that comes from sin. So the bottom line is, how are we going to deal with it? That's part of that learning how to fail, right? Well, part of how they're going to succeed is you're going to have to teach them, listen, when you come to that point, you choose to either grow up or you grow apart in every relationship, right? Nobody just stays the same. You're always moving. So you're always growing up or you're growing apart. Those are your options. And in your marriage, you're either going to grow more mature or you're going to grow apart. People say, well, you know, we're just, we've just decided that we're incompatible. Let's just be honest. Incompatible is a legal synonym for immature. I mean, it's your choice. You choose maturity or you choose immaturity. If you want to be selfish, yeah, God's going to let you be selfish and you're going to deal with the conflicts for the rest of your life. I mean, understand this. If your life is always surrounded, no matter where you go or what you do, there's always drama swirling around you. <laughs> you know, if you're not an EMT, that's not normal. <laughs> if you're an EMT, we expect that, right? We kind of hope they're used to that. <laughs> well, not their own stuff, but our stuff. 
Yeah. We're kind of like pig pen in the, the cartoon, right? There's always a cloud of swirling stuff around us. Listen, if you want to be selfish, you're always going to have that. But if you learn to both grow up, if you both learn to give, if you both learn to grow together, guess what's going to happen, pig pen? The dust will settle. So the relational question that plagues us is this. <laughs> what's your fig leaf? What's your fig leaf? What is it you're wearing to keep people from seeing you? What is it you've got between you and other people? What's your fig leaf? Now, having said that, if your fig leaf really is all you have, please continue to wear it. <laughs> if you don't have clothes, right? But that's a consequence of the fall. And it prevents us from finding the very thing we're looking for, which is to know and to be known. All right, next thing, E. There's a spiritual discontent and darkness. So this Bible character Job was the wealthiest man in the world during his day. And he described that spiritual discontentment, this spiritual darkness like this. Job chapter, chapter 6 verse 18. He says, I am like a caravan lost in the desert while searching for water. That's pretty hopeless. You know, when I was pastoring in Oklahoma... I was going to help with the funeral of a young gal who died, and she's very popular. It's the school's a teacher, and they were going to be, I mean, there were like thousands of people that came out for this funeral. And the burial was about an hour and a half away. And so we, uh, I, I ride in, I'm riding in the hearse, and the, the hearse has decided, okay, we're going to, we don't, the, I've got this kid who's brand new at the funeral home. He'd been there a week. He's going to drive to the hearse. They told him, follow the car ahead of you, and we'll get you there, because this cemetery was off in the middle of God's nowhere in Oklahoma which is a big, wide area. And uh, so we took off driving. We had like 40 cars behind us and stuff. And so we're going along, and he and I are yapping and talking in the front and telling stories and stuff. And all of a sudden, I look up, and we're pulling into McDonald's <laughs> in this little town in Oklahoma. It's like, what are we doing in McDonald's? And he turns, and he looks at me, and I can see that his blood has just frozen and dropped to his feet, and his colon is going full-on spastic now because we got separated from the car he was following, and we followed a car we didn't know into a McDonald's, and we've got 40-some cars behind us. <laughs> now, this was pre-cell phone days, all right? So we're just trying to figure out where to go. So we stopped at a gas station and got a map, and we found a town that we think we're headed towards, you know, and we're trying to figure out how to get there. And so when we get to that town, then we get out, and we have to, we have to find out exactly where the cemetery is. We got to the cemetery an hour and a half after everyone else. Only funeral I've ever been at where they applaud when the hearse pulls up. <laughs> now, that wandering around, I mean, that's kind of that idea. I'm lost. I'm not even sure where I'm going now. I have no idea what's going on. And you've got Job saying, I'm, like, I'm lost like I'm a, a caravan in the desert. I don't even know what I'm thirsty for. I'm just out here wandering around. See, when you get disconnected from the source of life, when you get disconnected from your creator, it's going to lead to an emptiness inside of you that is going to eat you alive, and it's going to lead you into a spiritual darkness. Ephesians 4, they've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch, not only with God, but with what? Reality. Listen, that's not a pretty picture. So we live on a broken planet. We've got natural disasters all around us. We've got deformities in children, physical decay, disease, death, emotional distress, disappointment. We've got distance between all of us and the people we want to be close to. We've got the spiritual discontentment. It's no wonder if that's all you're seeing in the world that you're depressed, right? It's no wonder so many people are on antidepressants. If I thought that was the end of the world anymore, I'd be doing that too. But there's good news. How can you be happy in a world that's so full of pain and suffering and sorrow and broken relationships and bad memories? Well, you do what Jeremiah did. Now, let me qualify. Some of you think that Jeremiah was an alcoholic bullfrog. <laughs> all right. That's not the Jeremiah you imitate. All right. <laughs> Jeremiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. He wrote two books, one of them called... Jeremiah. Isn't that clever? They were so good with that in the Bible. Um, and another one's called the Book of Lamentations, which actually means the Book of Sorrows. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Today, we would just call him the big crybaby in the Bible, right? 
But watch what he says in Lamentations 3. Here's how he handles all this. He kind of describes the situation, and then he describes the solution. I cannot find peace or remember happiness. Just thinking of my, my troubles and my lonely wandering makes me miserable. That's all I ever think about, and I'm depressed. Then I remember something that fills me with hope. The Lord's kindness never fails. If he'd not been merciful, we would have been destroyed. The Lord can always be trusted to show mercy each morning. Deep in my heart, I say, and underline the whole rest of that verse, the Lord is all I need. I can depend on him. That's the answer. That's the answer. All right, number three. Why did God allow this mess to happen? Now, you remember back in the, in the book of Genesis, there was actually a time where God looked down at the world and he said, this is nuts. And he decided there was only one righteous man on the planet, so he took that righteous man and his unrighteous family, seven more of them, had them build a boat, and God wiped out the entire world and started all over again. All right? So here we are today. Scripture says that at the end times, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. People are going to be doing their own thing and rebelling against God. So why doesn't God just go ahead and wrap everything up? Why does he let it go on? Why doesn't he just bring things to a conclusion now and be done with it? Well, let me give you some reasons for that. First one, A, to give us a choice. He's given us a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 15. Today, I am giving you a what? A choice between good and evil, between life and death. God says, I want it to be your choice to love me and to follow me. I'm not going to force it on you. I'm going to let you choose. That's the good news. Here's the bad news, Ecclesiastes 3. In due season, God will judge who? Everyone. Everyone. Both good and bad for their deeds. So there's going to be a day of accounting where you have to stand before God and you have to explain to God why you made the choices you made on earth, but for now you're still free to choose. Right now, here's the second thing. B. He lets it go on to show us the need for our uh, the need for a savior. Ecclesiastes three eighteen. God allows people to continue in their sinful ways so He can test them. That way, they can see for themselves that they are no better than animals. In other words, they're just running on their instincts, running on their sinful nature. See, without God in your life, your life tends to degenerate and you start behaving like an animal, which is a creature without a conscience. He says, so the world's full of a lot of people who don't have conscience. See, the arrogance of human nature is we think we don't need God. Secretly, we think, I don't really need him. People get through this all the time. I'm sure I'm one of them. I could do this my own way. In fact, I think I know more about this than God does because I'm me and I'm special. My mom said I was. And I mean, look how happy I am. I'm a big success story now. And when God says, don't do these things that I happen to like doing, and I go ahead and I do them because, of course, I'm me and I know more than God. What do I end up with? I end up with a broken heart. I end up with a, a, a broken body and broken dreams and broken relationships and broken promises and broken memories. And God says, these boundaries that I set for you, these rules that I set for you, those aren't for my good. Those are for your good. I give you those limitations to protect you so you realize you need me. All right, next thing, C. To demonstrate his grace. This is one of my favorite verses in the scripture, 2 Peter 3. The Lord isn't being slow about his promise to return as some people think. No, he is being what? Patient. Why? For your sake. He doesn't want anyone to perish, so he is giving more time for everyone to repent. See, the reason God puts up with all the grief and things that break his heart when he sees his people doing it on the planet, he's doing it so that more people have time to step across the line and become a part of his family. All right, so let's wrap it up. Conclusion, what do I need to do? I need to respond. I need to respond to his grace. Romans chapter 5. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yeah, people sinned even before the law was given, and though there was no law to break since it had not yet been given, they all died anyway, even though they did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. What a contrast between Adam and Christ who was yet to come. And what a difference between our sin and God's generous gift of forgiveness. For this one man, Adam, brought death to many through his sin. 
But this other man, Jesus Christ, brought forgiveness to many through God's bountiful gift. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of the one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But we have the free gift of being accepted by God even though we are guilty of many sins. The sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over us. But all who receive God's wonderful, gracious gift of righteousness will live and triumph over sin and death through the one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brought condemnation upon everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness makes people right in God's sight and gives them life. Because one person disobeyed, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed, many will become made right in God's sight. Would you pray with me? Fathers, I look out on this service, I realize that there's a, there's a lot of pain right here in these hearts that are present today. There's a lot of concern, there's a lot of stress. Father, people who are in relational discord, they're in a world of hurt. They're in distance or they're in they're dealing with emotional distress or father they've gone through a big disappointment or they've had a death of a loved one or they're having problems with their bodies or all these things that are being a part of a planet that's been broken by our sin and our evil father a lot of times we don't even know where we're going father i pray this morning that these who are here would turn their needs and their hearts to you they would not just go out and continue to wander their own way, but that they would yield to you. Now I want to give you a chance to pray today, and I'm just going to lead you in kind of a, a model. Put it in your own words, but you can say something right now like, Father, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. I want to accept that you died for my sins to take away all the guilt of my life. I'm grateful for the choice. I'm grateful for your giving me a choice between good and evil. And today, Father, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing good. I'm choosing life over death. I'm choosing your purpose over my plans. Father, I cannot thank you enough for your patience in allowing me another day in which I can make a choice toward you. Thank you for helping me see the need for my Savior that, that you've given to me. Father, thank you for your grace. Help me to remember that all of this life, this earth, this universe is temporary and that the pain is not going to be forever. Father, help me to reject man-made solutions, but to realize that you're all I need. Help me to reach out with your love to those who don't know you yet so that they can choose to become a part of your family. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.